Um, thanks very much for joining this week, uh, Fish Five Hundred Seminar. First of all, uh, I would like to uh, we would like to acknowledge that uh, the majority of us here today are located on the Vancouver area and therefore uh, are gathered on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of Musqueam, uh, uh, Squamish, um, and the uh, Swalas two people. And um, even though we are uh, remotely, I think uh, it is. Uh, Important to uh, to acknowledge this um, um, uh, this um, uh, and um, so the process of this seminar um, will be uh, first. It will be actually similar to what we have with the normal uh, Fish Five Hundred seminar, except that everything is online, uh, and that particularly the Q and A sections uh, is one uh, a little bit differently. Um, so during the Q&A portions of the seminar, if you ask questions um, live, uh, your voice may show up in the audio, however, no face, uh, so you don't have to show your face, uh, other than the presenter and those providing the introduction uh, will be posed. Uh, so if you have a question, you can post it on the, Q uh, on the chat box, and then uh, you will be also um, point out, um, uh, call out to, to ask the questions um, uh, live. Uh, with your voice, uh, and Colette uh, and Gabriel is here to uh, are here to help with uh, uh, coordinating that component, the Q and A component. And uh, so, first of all, uh, after these uh, introductions um, of the process, uh, I would like now to introduce our speaker today, uh, uh, Robert Bliss, a physica, and uh, he is a researcher as the um, Stockholm Resilience Center in uh, in Switzerland, uh, in Sweden. Sorry, <laughs> I was just talking about Switzerland, <laughs> uh, where he focuses on his work focuses on aspect of international collaboration um, and cooperation, sustainable management of the oceans and ocean stewardship. I mean, Robert is one of the most um, interdisciplinary uh, and having a diverse portfolio researchers that I have met. Uh, I first met uh, Robert uh, when he was a senior research associate in the nurses program. At, uh, at the time, I was uh, the director of science, um, uh, and so I have uh, lots of opportunities to um, to communicate and uh, work with Robert uh, in a number of initiatives. And from there, I just kept every time I see, I saw his work, uh, it surprised me of the uh, diversity of things that uh, he has been doing. And um, his recent work uh, is focused on the international negotiations around biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdictions, a very topical um, uh, subject at EPNJ. Um, and he has been uh, the leaders in uh, uh, the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, particularly leading one of the reports uh, in, the, in that um, with Colette as well. Um, and uh, I noticed that in your website that there's something that I discovered again, surprised me. You are a translator, a German um, English translator, and you are translating a book uh, a, a, on, on East Asia. Um, so yes, yeah, and other things that every time I, I, I work with uh, Robert, uh, something to surprise me. So today um, I will now give the floor to Robert um, who will be um, uh, speaking about um, the ocean genome and future prospect for conservation. Thank you, Robert. Well, th thank you so much, William, for the kind introduction. And I, I have to say it's all your fault because when I joined the Nereus program, I talked with you and you said, you, you have the freedom now to explore what you're interested in. And I'm permanently confused, which means I go in all directions and you encouraged it. So I'm, thank you very much for that. Um, and I, I just wanted to thank the organizers uh, before starting just because it, it's really a treat to be able to speak um, to the UBC seminar. I mean, UBC is a legendary place for marine science. And I know a number of the names on this call. I know you personally, and I know all of your work, I think also. So I, I just say it's, it's so nice to, to be here. And as you mentioned also, William, a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today, it's been done in collaboration with colleagues, including Colette, so if there's anything I say today in my presentation that seems totally crazy or strange, you can always talk with Colette. So you have a backup option if we don't get to it in the question and answer today. Okay, so let me just jump right into the presentation. So as William said, the, the focus here is on the ocean genome and future prospects 
for Conservation and Equity. And you've seen this, this title, right? But you probably, maybe you're asking yourself, what is, what is this ocean genome anyway? What is, what is this term? Maybe it's something about biological diversity, genetic diversity, maybe marine genetic resources. Well, yeah, it's a bit of all that stuff. But we've created our own definition. And this is from the blue paper for the high-level panel. The ocean genome is the foundation upon which all marine ecosystems rest and is defined here as the ensemble of genetic material present in all marine biodiversity, including both the physical genes and the information they encode. It's a mouthful, but we'll be coming back to this a little later, and I think it's going to make more sense as we go further into the discussion. But first, let's meet the ocean genome. So what, what is life in the ocean like? Well, it's really old compared to life on land. Life in the ocean has existed for somewhere around 3.7 billion years, around three times as long as life on land. And it's a very diverse habitat, of course. It covers 70% of the Earth's surface. Some parts of the ocean, there's a complete absence of light, extreme pressure, extreme chemistry, extreme this, that, and the other. And wherever you look in the ocean, you find life. And life is somehow making you out of uh, is flourishing all throughout the ocean. And according to estimates, there's somewhere around 2.2 million species in the ocean. And just to give a comparison of how diverse the life in the ocean is compared with life on land, what this long evolutionary history has resulted in, of the 34 major animal phyla, only 12 are found on land, but 33 are found in the ocean. So known unknowns of the ocean genome, another mouthful, and it, maybe you think of Donald Rumsfeld now, but there's a lot we know that we don't know about the ocean genome. So somewhere between 24 and 98% of marine species remain undescribed, depending on the taxon group. So around 230,000 of those 2.2 million, and all of these estimates vary, um, but we're rapidly learning that we know less than we think we know. So there was a study from four years ago that estimated that around 15,000 marine viral populations exist in the ocean. But just two years later, or three years later, sorry, I'm exaggerating, they found that around 200,000 were identified, and this was using the Terra expeditions and other data sets, but a, a whole order of magnitude more discovered just in the span of three years. And in between, there's an article that I really like that estimates the number of virus particles in ocean waters at 1.3 times 10 to the 30th. And I was thinking about that last night, actually thinking, well, what, what sort of, how do you wrap your head around a number like that? I, when I see things like that, I start to think about, well, about like the size of the sun or the distance to the sun. Or, or what is this actually when you think of it? So I thought, well, how big is a virus particle actually? So here you see, there's, this is a range of things. So here's a frog egg. That's something you can see with your eye. It's about a millimeter. And here are atoms. You won't see those. They're really small, less than a nanometer. And then viruses are somewhere in between here. So according to what I was reading, they vary somewhere between 24 and 200 nanometers in length. So I thought, well, let's try to put that in perspective. 1.3 times 10 to the 30, if, if they're about 100 nanometers, take somewhere in between. How far is that if you stack them all on top of each other? So here's the distance to the sun. Is it somewhere around that? The distance to Pluto, 7.5, this looks like a trillion maybe meters away. Distance to the next galaxy, look at all of that. Well, here's what I came up with when I did the multiplication. So I don't know. I mean, of course, these are all estimates. And even if they're off by five orders of magnitude, it's still a crazy amount of uh, material in the ocean and to understand that we just know so little about it it just um, it's one of the reasons why it's so fun to talk about marine genetic resources you'll never um you'll never get bored i think but it's not just the biological diversity it's also the genetic diversity so in each of these species the total number of genetic characteristics and the genetic makeup is that diversity and that determines also the functional attributes of the species, their distribution, their adaptability. And these are really important um, issues in a changing climate and with all of the pressures that we're putting on the ocean today. So when we think about conserving genetic diversity, it's not just about conserving some species, it's about conserving the, the food webs that provide life in the ocean and that provide so much for human well-being. So it's, it's also their potential to recover and adapt to threats and changes in the environment around them, diseases, unexpected changes. So 
In some places, we've studied it very carefully. So salmon are a great example because it's a, it's a big money business, right? So we, we need to know about the, the, the vulnerability of salmon, how to make them more adaptable to uh, fishing pressures or to changing uh, climate and things like that. And the Bristol Bay salmon in Alaska, it's been studied very carefully and they've found over a hundred subpopulations. And this is a way to understand that you, you can fish in a way so that you don't um, exterminate some of these populations, which can then degrade the, the, um, the resilience of the entire population. And in some places we have, right? So in the Columbia River, there's some like the Chinook salmon that over two thirds of genetic diversity has been lost in some of these populations. And, it, and coral is also, the attention of the world is on coral reefs. And here there's a rush to identify corals that are a bit more heat resistant or a bit more resistant to this or that so that they have a better chance of surviving into the future. Well, how quickly can these uh, organisms adapt though? How, can, how quickly can they change? Well, pretty quickly in some cases. So there was a study a couple years ago looking at diatoms and they found that within just 200 to 600 generations of some of these, which is about six months, you could already start to see these adaptive changes. Or with corals, there's also some evidence that they've already started to adapt to ocean warming since the industrial revolution started. So there's some interesting aspects there also connected to the changing of the ocean genome, its resilience to the changes in the ocean. And I couldn't resist throwing this one in because this was a study that kind of blew my mind last year. Narwhals are just a bit strange when you compare them with everything else. I don't mean to pick on narwhals, but, but if you look here just on the left, I mean, these are kind of normal species. This is the type of genetic diversity you can expect, but here narwhals, they're, they're really low genetic diversity, but at the same time, they're really abundant. There are no signs of inbreeding, so it's a bit of a question mark, as far as I could tell from this article, which, again, I, it's one of these things where, well, does that mean that they're going to be more vulnerable if there is um, rapid warming in the Arctic, or what, what's going to happen to the narwhals in the future? Or maybe they're totally fine. Maybe this is all they need to survive. Pop quiz, all right, sorry, um, it's not really a pop quiz, it's just to wake you up and give you a little rush of adrenaline and scare you. But uh, we've talked a little bit already about the ocean genome, something about the ecological benefits, but I want to start thinking more about the human benefits. So there's a lot of interest in commercializing the ocean genome. So let me give you a couple, uh, a couple options here. So here we're going to look at a few different organisms and then try to match them with their marine biotechnology applications. So here, this is a really beautiful sea squirt that's found under the roots of mangroves in the Caribbean. Here's marine algae, so different types and genes of those combined with canola plants. What could that lead to? And here's a lugworm, that's a pretty one. So then here are your options. How do these all connect? So the first option here is long chain omega-3 fatty acids, the sort that you find in small fish in high levels. Or here's the next one, molecular respirator for COVID-19 patients. Which one could that be? And then the final one, anti-tumor chemotherapy drug, Yondolis. All right, I'm going to give five seconds. Just try to think how they match up and then I'm going to reveal all. All right, I, I feel like you've already figured it out. So I'm going to go straight into this. So the C squirt is the source of the anti-tumor chemotherapy drug. So we found that a lot of marine invertebrates, especially sponges, have been really rich sources of marine natural products. So these are bioactive compounds that are naturally produced by these organisms. And it's not totally clear, but it, it seems that in some cases, these uh, marine invertebrates like sponges, they, they spend their whole life, they're sessile organisms, so they're just stuck there and they're filtering all those billions and billions of viruses and all the other stuff in seawater all their life. And so they need to have perhaps these bioactive compounds that protect against that. It's one theory, but if I, I had a reviewer telling me, no, 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 it's just a theory. You can't be too clear about that. So anyway, that's one of the reasons why they've been a real stronghold for um, the development of pharmaceuticals. So there are a number of uh, anti-tumor um, and chemotherapy drugs associated with uh, marine sponges. So the next one, okay, it's the marine algae and the canola that leads to the omega-3 fatty acids. So this one kind of blows my mind. So they found that some of the genes from the algae that these small pelagic fish were eating that then resulted in them having these high levels of omega-3 fatty acids. If you take the genes from those marine algae and you splice them into canola, 
then you can grow canola on land. And even though it shouldn't really have high levels of omega-3 fatty acids in it, it does if you grow it on land with, these, with this genetic modification. So it's a GMO crop and it has a lot of applications for aquaculture because if you feed salmon a lot of soy, for instance, they're not going to have these high levels of omega-3 fatty acids that make them so nutritious um, and, and, and so tasty. Um, but if you do uh, grow this sort of canola, which I think Cargill is now doing in Canada or possibly the US, I, I always get it mixed up, um, then you end up with that on land. And the third one, it's the lugworms. This is a really fun one from France. So the lugworm, it, it has a, a type of hemoglobin that is I think about 40 times as effective as human hemoglobin at absorbing oxygen and transferring it. And it also, it's, um, I forget the specific terminology, but it's, uh, it's um, got like the, uh, you know how they're different blood types. So the lugworm has like the, the, the neutral blood type. So it's like a universal donor. So they thought, well, if this can transport oxygen so well, maybe it can be used for COVID-19 patients who are in severe distress uh, and uh, lacking the respiration. Um, but uh, unfortunately, there's not a happy story to that. They, uh, in France, they approved it for trials, and then they put a bunch of this blood in pigs, and then all of the pigs died. So they stopped the trials. So that one is just cut off. Maybe I should cut a line through that. Maybe it should be a dotted line, actually. But maybe it'll be revived. Um, we'll see. Um, but other applications, so all sorts of stuff can be done with marine genetic resources. There are enzymes to synthesize biofuels for marking and cutting DNA. This is a neat one because it's from hydrothermal vent uh, organisms, actually, for cosmetics, for antifoulants, adhesives. So these are kind of a yin and yang sort of thing. So if, as soon as you put a boat in the water or you build a structure in the water, you start to have stuff growing on it. And you need to have antifoulants so that you can remove all of that. But then all of those things that you're studying, that you're trying to get rid of, they have all these really interesting adhesive properties because they're sticking to your boat. So it's really interesting to look at them too for inspiration on how to develop adhesives that maybe can be used underwater. So those are kind of a, a back and forth, I, I like that. Antibiotics, antivirals and seaweeds, they're really on the radar now in the context of the pandemic. And bioremediation, so there's some, um, some uh, plankton that can also uh, naturally produce this sort of plastic substance, extracellular polymeric substances that can be used then for bioremediation, for sucking up some of these heavy metals and toxins and also used in oil spills and things like that. And there's even a cure for male pattern baldness. So that, I made that one up. Sorry, it's a, I just, the rest of it is true, but that one's just made up. But how long does it all take? So looking seriously again, this is looking at a risk of uh, whether or not it's a likelihood that you're going to start working on some marine genetic resource and actually end up with a product and the margin. So how much kind of financial benefit you can get if you do bring it to market. So these kind of increase <laughs> here towards the end. So you have the bulk chemicals and enzymes and things here and here at the high end, these are the ones that we're always thinking about like pharmaceuticals. But this timeline up here, this isn't months, this is years. So the, the time it takes to bring a pharmaceutical to market, it can be up to 20 years and it costs up to 2 billion US dollars to bring it from um, the development stage all the way through clinical trials into market. So this isn't a short thing and this is what we're trying to rush right now with the COVID-19 pandemic also, which means it's, it's a really tricky thing. But this is probably the, I, I, I don't know, maybe it's one of my favorites, but maybe also one of the most important applications of marine genetic resources is this green fluorescent protein, bioluminescent, um, pro, uh, a protein that creates bioluminescence in this jellyfish, the Echoia victoria. And it's used for protein tagging in a wide range of biomedical applications. So it lights up when you are uh, exposed to light and then the, you're, you're able to um, visualize a lot of things that otherwise wouldn't be possible. And it was so influential that actually the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2008 was awarded for the discovery and development of green fluorescent protein. So I'm gonna take a little pause here. Mm. And just wonder if you've heard this term, marine genetic resources, and start to wonder, well, how does this connect them with the ocean genome? Well, what are marine genetic resources? Well, we actually, it's not as simple as it may seem. So genetic resources have actually been defined. They have some standing in international law under the Conventional Biological Diversity 
It's a short definition, genetic material of actual or potential value. But then if you look at that, you say, well, what is genetic material? Genetic material is any material of plant, animal, microbial, or other origin containing functional units of heredity, such as individual genes or genetic sequences. So are marine genetic resources just that in the ocean? Well, it's not that simple. So what does the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea say? We always think of this sort of as the constitution of the ocean. It kind of manages all. Um, if you look for marine genetic resources, you won't find them in UNCLOS. They're nowhere. If you look for genetic resources, they're also not in there. Even biodiversity you won't find in UNCLOS. So there's some things that it dealt with and some things it didn't. But if you're thinking about genetic resources, one of the most important documents is the Nagoya Protocol of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was adopted in 2010 and entered into force four years later in 2014. And the whole aim of the Nagoya Protocol was to try to eliminate the worst, most exploitative forms of biopiracy. So these examples where you would have, for instance, a pharmaceutical company going to a remote part of a jungle in, uh, in, in, in the Amazon or in Indonesia maybe, and then developing pharmaceuticals based on the traditional knowledge of users in these communities and, and, and not giving anything in return. So this is the kind of the nightmare scenario that we, we just needed to stamp out. And I think that's what the Nagoya Protocol was able to do to some extent. And it's, it's aimed at requiring prior and informed consent and mutually agreed terms between the user and provider countries so that you end up having some transparency to these arrangements and hopefully also a bit more equity. Although some people also question how effective the Nagoya Protocol has been. And here's a good question. So can you find the governance gap in the ocean? So the Nagoya Protocol, it applies only to national jurisdictions, not areas beyond national jurisdiction. So it's basically just the dark blue areas. That's where it applies. And the light blue, it's about two thirds of the ocean. Nothing applies there. So access to res uh, genetic resources in that area and any sort of commercialization, it's totally liberal. You can go and collect what you want. You can do what you want with it. And you don't have to do a thing um, to, to share the benefits or communicate them to anyone. But there's a lot out there, right? And there's a lot down there too. The ocean on average is four kilometers deep and we're still just starting to map the seabed. So there's, there's still so much left to learn there. So it's um, one of the main elements of something you've probably heard about, the BB&J negotiations and the package that they talk about. So there are four issues in the BBNJ package. And the first is marine genetic resources, including questions on benefit sharing. So that's the, one of the challenges there is it still hasn't been defined. So the negotiators have been working on this for quite a while, but they still don't have a definition that everyone agrees on for what marine genetic resources are. So that's, that's a, a challenging starting point. The others are related to marine protected areas, so area-based management tools, to environmental impact assessments, and capacity building in marine tra technology transfer. And it's been a long, long, long winding road for BBNJ. So the, there was an ad hoc working group that was started following a UN General Assembly resolution in 2005. Uh, it ran for nine years from 2006 through 2015, a preparatory committee for two years, an intergovernmental conference that's now ongoing. Um, and I always try to think, well, how can you really represent how, how long this is? Um, and I know this is maybe a Canadian audience today, so here's Justin Bieber for you. Uh, this is how he looked in 2005. Here's him today. So this is what the BBNJ negotiation process has done to a, to a boy uh, and to all of us. And the question is, well, when would it actually be concluded? And I, it's I'm making a, a little bit silly, but when you think about an area that's almost half the Earth's surface, and thinking about these big gaps in governance, that's something we need to kind of turbocharge. We need to get going on this. So hopefully we can wrap this up soon, but it's still a few years off. I think even by the most optimistic uh, standards, we still have a bit of time to wait. So why are marine genetic resources the toughest part of the BBNJ negotiation? So there's a pair of articles that I really like that were published in 2009. That's this one led by Jesus Arieta. And then in 2010, uh, this is in Science uh, Policy Forum, by Sophia Anu Haung. And they basically looked at marine biodiversity and they, looked, they wanted to see where is it being commercialized? How is it being used? 
And here's kind of the take home message from Sophie's paper. That 10 countries account for 90% of patent claims associated with marine genes, including some from international waters. So this was done with um, all of the data that they had up to 2009. But then, then I had the question, well, which countries are they? We're talking in BBNJ all the time, but no one really quite knows what's happening in terms of commercialization and use of marine genetic resources. So what's happening within national jurisdiction? What's happening beyond national jurisdiction? And what's changed in the last 10 years? So this is the first bit of research that we engaged on. And we were thinking, well, if you look at all of these other sectors in the ocean, and this is a paper led by one of my colleagues at the Stockholm Resilience Center, Jean-Baptiste Chouffre, um, where he tried to map out from 1970 through 2020, uh, this is a 50 year time trends, for the blue acceleration. So trying to understand how human claims on the ocean, on this space and the materials um, have, have expanded over time. And you see something kind of similar in these, right? These kind of hockey stick curves. So the question mark was, well, what's happening with marine genetic resources? You probably have a bit of a guess just because you've seen the figure here, but let me show you anyway. So what did we do? Well, we isn't just me. So here's the team that we worked together with on a lot of the, uh, a lot of the initial papers in this area. So this is me and Jean-Baptiste who did the Blue Acceleration, Colette, who you know and love, uh, Emma Sundström and Henrik Österblom, uh, two of my other colleagues from the Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, we initially just wanted to answer, we'll kind of update Sophie and Jesus's papers. So we tried to understand what marine genes are showing up in patents, how many are out there, who's filing these patents, and where are those entities located? And to do that, well, we created a database of 38 million records of gene sequences and patents. So GenBank uh, has a patent division that collects all of the records of gene sequences associated with patent filings. And they look like this. So there are 38 million of these, and it's publicly available. You can go download them all tonight if you want. Um, and they look like this. And I'll tell you more about it in just a moment. But uh, so we identified all the patent records with listed species. So here you see this patent record. It's for a cauliflower mosaic virus. So not so relevant for the BBNJ negotiations, perhaps. Um, and then we did a taxon match with the World Registry of Marine Species Database. So we tried to look at which of these 38 million patent uh, records um, had listed species. So uh, there were 8,032 species listed, including the cauliflower mosaic virus. And we did a taxon match with the 240,000 named species in worms and narrowed this down to 1,720 species. And then we looked at each of those to try to understand what type of species is this is it a species that's only found in the, on the coastline of Vanuatu, or is it a species that's only found in a hydrothermal vent in areas beyond national jurisdiction, or is it found everywhere? And it looks something like this. You can find it all in the supplementary materials of this paper. And then we've just made some, it's some choices, some methodological choices on what to exclude. So there were some false hits, so rats and flowering plants and things like that that we just had to chuck. We took seabirds out and we took out the cosmopolitan microbes, so stuff that could be found in a cow's stomach, but also in the ocean or on your skin, but also in the ocean somewhere. Because we thought, well, if you're going to research this or commercialize it, you're not going to go to the ocean. You'll just scratch your skin or you'll, you'll ask the cow if you can, <laughs> you can get a sample. Um, and our final result after doing all that airing was that we found 862 marine species and almost 13,000 patent sequences. And then we wanted to go back to these initial patent uh, records to understand who it is who's filing these patents. So this is another piece of it. So we already saw about the cauliflower mosaic virus. Here's who, who filed for the patent. In the year 1987, Agricultural Genetics Company Limited. Well, that's when you have to Google and try to find out who they are, where they are. And here's the actual sequence down here. I didn't mention this, but you can find these also. They're all listed in the, uh, in the database. And then we, so we did that, we Googled and we tried to find out who are these, uh, these entities that are registering the filings. And uh, let me just show you what the results look like. So here's the 862 species over time. And here's also the number of sequences. So about 13,000 over time. So Jean-Baptiste is a happy man. He was able to complete his figure and he, uh, he's got a nice, a nice uh, graph there. But who's been filing the patent? So we found that one 
multinational organization, um, a company, the BASF, the world's largest chemical company, which is headquartered in Germany, had registered, had filed 47% of the patent sequences. And all the other companies combined, it was just 37%. So these guys were pretty active in this area. And then universities, this is one I was especially curious about. It was about 12%, and then there's another 4% of hospitals and individuals and some other um, kind of uh, unusual kind of entities. But then there's some sort of keystone pattern here also that, you know, so here's Germany, thanks largely to BASF, and the USA, Japan, Israel, so forth. And so I thought, well, thinking back on Sophie's paper, what are we at? So the top three countries, 70%, uh, everyone else is 30%. What do you do for the top 10 countries? So it's 98%. So uh, when Sophie published her paper, it was 90% of the patents were associated with 10 of the countries. And now it's 98%. It seems like maybe we're not going in the right direction. But why does it matter? Well, marine biotechnology is sometimes seen as one of the pillars of the blue economy. But the blue economy should be founded on principles of equity, inclusivity, all the fairness, all these sort of things that, um, I mean, it kind of sounds natural that we should be striving for. And this doesn't quite look like that. So what are the barriers to more inclusive participation in this industry? And are they falling or are they rising? So I would, uh, I just wanted to show you a few figures that I think give some insight into this area. So this is a map of um, research vessel capacity from the International Research Vessel Database. And it just shows where, basically, where there are research vessels registered around the world. And you see it's kind of the usual suspects. That there's quite a lot in the global north. And then a big chunk of the world doesn't really have a research vessel capacity. Uh, sorry, and the offshore research vessel capacity, I should say, this is just a proxy. But th this is for boats that are 50 meters or more in length. So it's a big vessels and uh, maybe we'll be able to actually go out further into the ocean to collect samples and so forth. Uh, here's a, um, a graphic from the UNESCO Global Ocean Science Report from three years ago. And this is showing something quite similar, but it's just the, um, a map that's been distorted to show the relative importance of different countries in terms of scientific publications related to marine science. And again, you see this really striking um, imbalance between the global north and south. And also within the context of BBNJ, it's, it's, it's an area that I'm particularly interested in. But I looked at, I did a, a paper a few years ago with some colleagues where we looked at a few proxies for trying to understand the, um, the capacity for countries to participate in a meaningful manner in these negotiations and assert their views and really push them so that they're included in the, whatever international law comes out of this process. So this was one of those proxies. We looked at the number of publications by researchers uh, associated with BBNJ, and we found that uh, most of them were from five countries. So the, those are the flags you see here. And there were 163 countries that didn't have any, publica any authors publishing papers on BBNJ topics. Here's another way to look at it. So this is um, thinking back about the slide with Justin Bieber. I, I told you there was this 10 year period of working groups um, from the UN General Assembly. And this uh, included nine meetings over that 10 years. And we wanted to look at the number of meetings that, well, sorry, I should say, I got participant lists from UN Doalos just to find out who was at each of those meetings. You, you can actually request these. And then I, I went through with a colleague and we just found, so we compared all of the names, it took forever, but we were able to say how many meetings each individual um, attended. And the reason that's important is that if you have continuity in your delegation, then you also have that institutional memory and you have more of your personal networks, you have more of a capacity, I think, also to engage in the negotiations. So this shows that around 1,500 people attended at least one meeting, but then when you find at least two meetings, it drops to about 400. So most people, they only went to one meeting and never came again. Um, at least three meetings, you come down to about 200, four, you start dropping off quickly. And then this is a stack graph that just shows who are those people. So you kind of need to look at these side by side. In the beginnings of the SIDS and LDC, small island developing states in least developed countries, that's the yellow down here. So you see there, there some representation is certainly underrepresented even in the, at least one meeting. But by the time you get to five or six meetings, it drops off a lot. And then there are none, no representatives from all the SIDS and LDCs in the world that attended 
more than six meetings. And then you see the, the countries with the greatest continuity in their delegations are OECD member states and NGOs. So the NGOs actually, I think, have a very strong role here in having some sort of continuity and understanding where the negotiations are heading and hopefully also pushing them forward. But when I look at this, this also screams in my face that if we get an equitable outcome and a, 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 that's, that's going to change these trajectories from the BBNJ negotiations, it's it's going to be a bit of a surprise um, and due to very hard work by the people involved. But uh, this makes me a little bit pessimistic, to be honest. Okay, so I, I talked a lot about the ocean genome in the beginning. I talked a bit about marine genetic resources. Let me go back again to that big definition I threw in your face at the beginning. So I just highlighted the last little bit here. So the ocean genome includes both the physical genes and the information they encode. Why would I include something like that? What are we talking about? This, this uh, difference between some physical material and some intangible material, something you could write down on a piece of paper or you could save on, in a computer file. Well, it's because we're doing exactly that. The technological advances in this area are moving at light speed. So here's a map here, uh, a graph here on the left that shows the average sequencing cost over the last 20 years of one raw megabase of DNA. So that dropped from around 6,000 US dollars 20 years ago to about one cent today. So this, it's a logarithmic scale here. So that's a massive change, right? So they, there was the Human Genome Project that attempted to map the human genome. It cost, I think, a couple of billion dollars. It took about 10 years. And now, I mean, you can send your DNA for sequencing right away, right? And it's, it's not a, it's, it's a very different world today. But what's come with that is that we also have these sequence, um, uh, these databases of genetic sequence information that are growing exponentially. So GeneBank, for instance, that I mentioned earlier, its sequence read archive has been growing exponentially for years now and doubling in size every 18 months. So this is growing and growing and growing. And this is basically, it's a public database. It's accessible to all. And the challenging thing here is that as the marine biotechnology world advances, the importance of databases is, is increasing along with all these advances in omics technologies and uh, methods. And the reliance on physical samples is decreasing. So I won't make a value judgment of whether this is good or bad. It's, it's simply the way things are moving now in, in this world. But I would point at the Nagoya protocol, I think it's best equipped to address physical samples. Um, it's, it's not really set up to handle digital sequence information. It's not regulating it right now. And it's right now it's the, the subject of negotiation also under the auspices of the CBD, whether or not the Nagoya protocol actually extends to this or whether it's just these physical samples. And one of the reasons that this is a, uh, such a tricky issue is that disclosing the origin of genetic resources is not required in patent filings. So this is something under the under the um, mandate of the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. And they're, they're talking about it as well, but it's, uh, it's, it's one of the tricky things when we're discussing marine genetic resources in the BBNJ negotiations. They're talking about digital sequence information in the CBD. The World Intellectual Property Organization is talking about disclosure of origin and patent filings. They, they all are kind of mixing together. And then negotiators in any of these fora, they always say, well, actually, the other forum should be dealing with that. You shouldn't even be talking about this. And it just kind of goes in a circle. And at the same time, you have these exponential growth in these databases, which it's really frustrating for a lot of um, people in developing countries who see that basically all of this genetic information based on the biodiversity of their countries, it's entering into the public domain. And they don't have necessarily the research capacity to fully uh, capitalize on it, and others are. So it, it's, it's a tricky time. But uh, sorry, I'll just uh, really quickly go through one final study here, which looked specifically at that little wedge of the pie at universities. What's going on there? Um, so we looked at each of those patent filings to find out whether or not these university researchers who are at public research organizations whether they were disclosing origin in their patent filings or not. And again, it's not a legal requirement. You don't have to do it. But uh, we were curious whether they were doing it or not, because it could be seen as some sort of best practice or maybe a norm of transparency. And if you're uh, 
complying with the Nagoya protocol, it shouldn't cost you a cent. It should be no problem at all. So basically these dark black countries, those are the ones where the most activity is happening at universities. And then all the dots, that's just where all the universities are. And then this shows who's disclosing origin and who's not. So basically almost no one is disclosing the origin in their patent filings, but a little wedge is. And that was the one where I thought, well, we could write this paper and we could just say, everyone's a villain. Why are they not disclosing this information? It should cost nothing. But uh, instead I thought, well, why don't we talk with those people who are disclosing origin and say, why did you do it? Um, what was your motivation? Is it a norm that is developing within the community? And so I contacted, you can go back to the patent filings, you can find out who the people are associated with them, and I tracked them down and emailed them all, had conversations with a few of them. And basically the question is, why are the good apples so good? Why are you, why are you doing this? And this is my favorite answer of all. The simple reason that some information on origin of biological samples was given within the patent was that some of that text had been written for some other purposes, and it was simply copy and pasted into the patent. There was no other strategy or reasoning other than laziness and convenience. So there's, there you go. I mean, it's easy to look at the results and think, well, some people are just ahead of the curve, but it doesn't seem to be the case. It just seems to be um, luck or chance. But I think that there is, uh, sorry, I shouldn't read through all of this, but basically this is a, an excerpt from the paper where we argue that scientists, they, they don't need to wait for, for Justin to get older. They can already be moving forward with uh, transparently sharing this information and um, yeah, setting a good example. I mean, it's, it's harder to change industry maybe, but academics, they're, they're, their currency is journal publications maybe, so you could ask journal editors to require that disclosure of origin is also part of the, 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 the filing of your, your sequences before submitting um, uh, publications. Five of the countries were re responsible for most of this uh, university-led commercialization, so you could also talk with the research councils in those five countries and ask them because, they, I mean, research councils will be requiring all sorts of reporting on their grants but they can also require that any funded research also uh, involves disclosure of origin within your sequences and any commercial or non-commercial uh, work. So what's next for the ocean genome? So the BBNJ negotiations, they're really, really important. And it's, I made a little bit of fun of them because it's moving so slowly, but it, it's really important for scientists to engage as much as possible because it's a lot of bureaucrats sitting there. It's ministry representatives, it's, um, people who maybe have really diverse portfolios in a lot of countries who they're maybe responsible for 10 different things, including BBNJ. So they need as much support as they can get uh, on the current state of the science and also uh, what the uh, kind of what's at stake with uh, making sure that we get this treaty in place. In my opinion, no one has been able to satisfactorily or convincingly pin down the actual value of marine genetic resources. And this isn't just questions about future applications, it's just even the ones today. How do you put a price tag on something like this GMO canola? Or how do you put a price tag on some of these other, um, these other uh, things that have been developed? And it, it's, I think that having something, um, something like this, it, it would really provide some clarity also in the BBNJ negotiations. So I think that's some research that hasn't been done. It would be good to, uh, to do it if possible. And we need to learn how to better mobilize these technolo technological advances and databases for conservation as well. And there was a really nice paper published just a couple months ago on it. It's titled The Genetic Rescue Toolkit by Ben Novak and others. And I, I really recommend it. It kind of charts out all the kind of different angles and approaches for using this improved understanding of the ocean at a genetic level for conservation. And finally, most importantly, is building in more equity into responsible research and inclusive innovation. And this, these will be familiar themes to, to you, but it, it, it all comes down to capacity to do the research, access to technology, to data, collaborations that are built on equal footing, having finance, um, it's, it's all the same things. But now that we're talking about the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, I think it's a good time to be pushing a bit harder on all of this. And, uh, and there, there are big ob obstacles to this. So we, we need to figure out how to implement these benefit sharing agreements, but we also need to make sure that 
when the private sector is involved in these uh, equations, of course, they're going to be supporting certain types of innovation, but maybe they're going to be some innovations that are needed by humanity or by disadvantaged groups that just aren't going to be prioritized by the private sector. And there you need government agencies or NGOs or others to come in and fill that gap, so things like neglected diseases. But I'll, I'll just leave it there because I'm really interested to hear what sort of questions you have. And these are some of the, uh, I can send the slides later to Catherine, but these are some of the uh, papers that I've talked about today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Robert, this boy wonderful presentation and uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I'm sure it stimulated lots of the uh, questions and thinking and discussion I already see uh, in the Q&A uh, chat box. Uh, there are lots of questions waiting for you. I will pass the uh, floor to uh, Colette and Gabriel who will be uh, moderating the question and answer section. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert, um, yeah, for a fantastic talk and for making us laugh and also for a very timely talk. Uh, given that those um, biodiversity beyond natural jurisdiction um, sessions have just started again. Um, so the first question is from Spencer and he's unfortunately, see he was so interested in this talk that he's connecting from a bus. And so he's asked me to read out the question to you. So he was saying whether um, essentially, basically by potentially destroying deep sea ecosystems through deep sea mining, we may be losing economic opportunities. So his question is, there could be organisms in some of these mining footprints that have genomes with economic values of millions or billions of dollars that could be lost forever if we aren't careful. Um, so just your thinking around that. Hi Spencer, thanks for calling in from the bus. I hope you can hear us okay. Uh, it's a great question and I, I think there, there are a couple angles to this. I, I think one is that the kind of the genetic resources people kind of sit together and the deep sea mining people sit in one place and then all the people trying to stop deep sea mining sit in another place. And it'd be really good to bring those together because I, I think that uh, it's, it's really important that to understand again this kind of known unknowns, just how much we don't know about the deep ocean. And it's vast, right? We, we, there's so much we don't know. And one of the big aspects there, it's not just maybe these biotechnology applications that could potentially exist related with these uh, unknown organisms and unknown properties, but also the, the functionality of these ecosystems. So they, they, they have very important role in carbon cycles. They have a very important role in the, in the, in, in the Earth's climate. And mm -hmm. if we, we mess up the biodiversity in the deep ocean, we may also be having a really serious impact on the, the Earth's climate and uh, or, or undermining a key element of, car of carbon sequestration, of moving all of that carbon from the surface ocean deep into the ocean, um, to the seabed. So I think there's a lot there. And sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up in a moment, but I, I another thing that kind of blew my mind just in the last couple of months, we started engaging with some researchers who work with crustal biodiversity. And this is where, I mean, you think of marine genetic resources, maybe it seems simple. I mean, just anything that's in the ocean, but actually, if you go all the way to the bottom of the ocean and then you keep digging down into the seabed, you can dig really deep and still be finding stuff that's alive. Um, and that's a whole world that we're just starting to scratch the surface of, kind of literally. Um, and is, are those marine genetic resources? And can these mining companies that are actually drilling down there, can they be helping us to understand that? I, yeah, so it's more questions than answers, Spencer, but uh, thanks for that. Um, thank you very much. I'm off a bus now, and uh, that was a, a great answer. And what I was trying to get to is um, that it seems, well, um, I was just wondering, there's usually a lot of arguments about the environmental cost, but um, I'm interested in knowing if there's also an economic, um, you know, discussion that isn't being had. And it kind of sounds like there is. So thank you. I mean, just one thing to kind of put on your radar, Spencer, there's um, a group called the Blue Climate Initiative. Uh, Colette and I are also working on this one together, but it's um, there they've, they've actually joined together the mineral and genetic resources under the umbrella of a single working group. I'm working there with Diva Amen, who's more of a, a seabed uh, or deep sea uh, ecologist. Um, and we're working on a, a paper now that should be out in the next month or so that tries to also understand what's the potential for trying to value the, or, or understand the value of these intact ecosystems. So not just thinking about the value of the mineral resources or potential value of genetic resources, but what's the value of having that ecosystem intact and functioning? Um, but, but that'll also be more of a question than an answer. So don't get your hopes up too much. 
Go ahead, you can ask another question to Robert. Sure, hey Robert. Thanks again for your talk and uh, for making me laugh a lot <laughs> in these troubled times. I was uh, wondering um, with your experience on, on all the meetings in, in the areas beyond national jurisdiction, uh, you were talking about how there's these classic uh, countries that kind of control everything. And within these discussions, have you, what is their, um, I mean, what are they doing to reach a more equitable agreement? Or like, are they even trying to consider smaller nations that don't have a lot of pow power or they, or from a critical perspective, it's just like a smoke screen? It's, it's a really good question, Juliano. I, um, I kind of scratch my head when I listen into the, I've, I've only been to two of the meetings personally, and uh, I've, I've tuned into a few of them um, just virtually, but uh, it's, it's hard to kind of judge it because it's very circular. I mean, they keep saying the same stuff again and again and again, I and mean, that's why Justin keeps getting older. Um, but it's, um, from my perspective, there, there are a few people, um, just a, maybe like four or five people who are incredibly eloquent and powerful speakers among the small island developing states and least developed countries. And they, to me, they're the most important people in these negotiations because the MGR's debate, it's the trickiest one of the four package elements. And I think that handful of four or five people, they have the respect and the authority to speak on behalf of, on behalf of their regional groups. Um, and they're pushing really hard. And I, I, I think the world of them, I, I, I think it's, um, it's so important. At the same time, it, it, sometimes it looks like it's more of a trading game that um, some of the global North countries, they're pushing really hard uh, on behalf of NGOs and on behalf of their own national governments to, to push MPAs in areas beyond national jurisdiction. That's what they want. It's their wish list. Um, and the least developed countries, it's, they're, they're pushing really hard to have some sort of substantial benefit sharing related with marine genetic resources because they, they have this sense that even if it's just a couple patents or even if it's just a couple of applications that this is everyone's heritage. It's the high seas, it's areas beyond national jurisdiction that belong to everyone. So they, there's, a, I think, a real sense of, of, of justice to it too, that this needs to be in there. That I think there's give and take, but I, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I, I wish I knew more, but I, um, I, I, I get a bit confused by it. And I, yeah. But if you, if you read through the minutes of some of these meetings, you'll see who those kind of handful of people are. And if you want to hear more, I mean, you can reach out to them too. Kara, yeah. um, do you want to ask your, next, uh, your question next, please? Yeah. yeah, so first of all, thanks so much for hosting this talk. Um, I'm very new to the idea of marine genomics. Um, it's obviously a large field and I have a lot of research to do. Um, but I was wondering how we can make sure that access to information and the process of using marine genomics itself, itself sorry about that, is equitable and how we can communicate their importance to the non-scientific community. Oh, it's, it's a tricky question. and I, <laughs> I, I feel like I'm kind of in the same boat with you because I, I know I, I showed some papers that we've published and we've been working in this area for a couple of years, but I feel like I'm just at the beginning of it. So I, I, for me, I, I recognize it's very easy to see that there's, there's something wrong with the kind of, <laughs> it's really imbalanced. There are the big challenges related to equity. But then if you ask me as an, the next question, how do you change that? How do you make it more equitable? What do you argue for in the BBNJ negotiation? I, I come up kind of blank sometimes, and I, I wish I had better answers, but the one that I usually go back to is uh, transparency. Just being as transparent as possible throughout your research collaborations, trying to expand them beyond maybe um, the kind of the most obvious collaborators in your direct surroundings to also engage people in other parts of the world. Um, and to, yeah, just to try to be, um, you know, try to go at it with the, with the best intentions and, uh, and be open every step of the way and then correct the course if you feel like you're off. Um, and Charity, we'll go to you for the last question. And then just to say that if you have more questions, feel free to also email Robert and we'll be sharing the chat with him as well so you can see the ones that he, we didn't get to. So Charity, over to you, please. Thanks so much, Robert. Um, I... I think that I'm sort of asking a bit of an extension of a question that was um, the last two questions. Um, 
so free feel free to do with it what you will but i was really quite shocked by the that 47 percent that is being dominated by one single multinational company um and were you able to get a sense when you're doing this work of what some of the outcomes of having so much of these genetic resources be patented under um, a singular entity that's not even- it's, yeah, it's funny, yeah, it's funny you asked that charity because I, after that study was published, it got a lot of media attention and people were really interested in, it was a very simple narrative that there's a evil corporation and down with the corporation. But, but I, I found myself in the interviews um, constantly defending the ASF because I, there are two angles to it. One is that uh, we looked at 38 million patent sequences and about 13,000 of that 38 million were associated with marine genetic resources. And then of that, about half were from the ASF. So it's a tiny drop in the bucket of all of the sort of biotechnology work that's going on. And we actually had a conversation with a representative of BASF and they were surprised. They didn't know. And it was a, it was a really nice conversation. But, uh, but the, the challenging thing also is that, I mean, we want companies to be investing in research and development. At least I do. So BASF, it's one of the cornerstones of their operations. They invest over $2 billion annually in research and development. For me, the issue is not, should BASF be doing this or not? It should be, well, why aren't more companies in more parts of the world doing this? Um, why, why is it just a few? Um, so I, to me, I, I don't know, I see BASF as, um, uh, in the best possible scenario, they could be a leader, they could be an ally in trying to push for uh, research collaborations, partnerships. Um, they should be at the BBNJ negotiations providing insight into what it means to be using and commercializing marine genetic resources. So I, I think it, if anything, they should be pulled closer into these discussions. And that's the one kind of bitter um, like, uh, triumph of that research is that the BASF got so much bad publicity after that pu study was published that I, I think it made them really angry. And they've started to engage in a lot of these negotiations now, among other things, to defend themselves. And I think they've been, um, I think rightfully so, good for them. And it's good that they're at the table. So I, I'm, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of a mixed blessing, uh, personally, but um, yeah. Great. Yeah, that's a really interesting perspective. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jay. So unfortunately, we have to wrap it up, Robert. Um, but thank you so, so much for um, coming to present to us virtually about this important topic. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. We had uh, another record um, attendance of 66 individuals. So that was really great turnout. Um, and yeah, as I said, we will be sending the chat to you, Robert, so that you can answer questions we didn't get round to. Um, and with that, um, we'll say goodbye for now. And uh, we'll see you next week for Dr. Dr. Jessica Sparks' uh, presentation on modern slavery at sea. Thank you so much, everyone.